Well, the first thing I have to say is the usual caveat. I am I'm now working at the Court of Justice, but whatever I say here is my own opinion. And whenever I say the court has said this or that, well, it might correspond to what the court has said, but it's mainly my reading of what the court has said. So my presentation is going to be on contract, tort, and the recent case law of the Court of Justice, with a specific uh, stressing specifically how the concept of contract and tort interplay. And then I would like to address also uh, some practical issues when you apply the provisions of the regulation regarding contract and tort. And for this, I, well, the, I, I'm going to, to split the time. I expect Professor has to tell me at some point to, to, to shut up, uh, because I think I have too much material. But uh, I will start with an introduction. Then I will address uh, this interplay, the, the, the definition of contract or matters relating to a contract and matters relating to tort and how they interplay. Then I will go to the next steps when we have decided that something is a contract or the next steps when something is taught, and then some conclusions. So the general framework, uh, maybe you don't need it because this is an advanced score, but nevertheless I wanted uh, to recall that when you, the, the system of the regulation is a quite simple system whereby when you are asking yourself as judges whether you are competent for adjudicating a case, the first idea is that you might be uh, competent if the parties have chosen you or uh, if you are the jurisdiction of the domicile of the defendant, and then uh, in some cases, and because there is a close connection between the court and the case, so in order to facilitate the administration of justice, then you can also be competent, not being neither chosen by the parties and not being the domicile of the defendant. So uh, the idea of proximity and the idea of predictability, which are uh, in those recitals of the regulation, are guiding principles of interpretation. So when you have to decide whether a subject matter of the, of the claim is a contract or is a tort, or when you have to decide whether you are the place of performance of a contract or a tort, you have always to have in mind proximity and predictability. Proximity meaning that you are a jurisdiction which is close to the facts, close to the evidence, so this facilitates the, the proceeding. But you also have to have in mind that uh, you cannot surprise the defendant. So the defendant can, must be able to foresee that he could be sued in this country and not in another, in another country when he entered into the contract on where he caused uh, the, the, the damage. These are guiding principles, and I want to stress at this moment that this, these are guiding principles. So it's something that you have to have in mind when interpreting the concepts. But we will see that the court has a little bit evolved, at least when it comes to torts, and that sometimes they are not only guiding principles of interpretation, but they seem to be corrective principles. So once a solution has been achieved, it might be that the court still corrects it in order to achieve more proximity or legal certainty. So they are not at the first stage of the interpretation, but rather they work at the last stage. And of course, you have to, to recall that, and this goes to the question that uh, was answered before, do, we have to, do you have to follow the court? Yes, of course you have to follow the court because you have to think as the court thinks, which means that interpretation has to be autonomous, and uh, then you have to stop thinking in the terms of your national uh, legislation. So the court is usually not wrong, the court is simply deciding differently. And you have to, uh, to take this in mind and to work as a European judge and not as a national one. So um, nowadays, after more than 50 years or 50 years after the Brussels Convention was adopted, are we still really thinking or discussing what is a contract and what is, it, what is a tort? Well, actually we are Although the court, had to, um, the, the court of Justice had to say what a contract is and what a tort is very early, in some seminal cases, which you can still find quoted in the uh, recent case law of the court. And the court said, uh, well, um, in, in a case where the claimant was suing in Germany for the, for, on contract for the breach of an obligation to provide information, and on tort since the defendant uh, had acted contra bonus mores, the court said two things. The first thing is um, tort is something which is not a contract, and uh, when uh, you adjudicate on a tort, there is no, and this is going to be said also uh, later, you are, you are 
adjudicating, when you have competence for a tort and there is a contract which is related or the other way around, you cannot simply use the visa attractiva and try to adjudicate both things at the same time. So there are separate concepts and although this may lead to fragmentation, to separate, to separate courts adjudicating on, a, on, a, on, a, on facts which are very much uh, related, this is what the court, at least uh, at the beginning, wanted. In the second case, uh, the question was on a chain of contracts. So you have a first uh, manufacturer of a product, then you have an intermediate who is selling the product, and then you have the final consumer or the person who buys the product. The product uh, has a problem, and it is the final person, the final uh, a buyer who wants to sue the manufacturer. So the question was, is this a contract, is this claim a contract, or is it rather to be adjudicated under the tort provision? And the court said, okay, this is not a contract because there is no obligation freely accepted as between the parties, the claimant and the defendant. And uh, then later, um, the court insisted in something which uh, might be a little bit weird, which is that in order to be under the contract uh, provision, so nowadays Article 71, you actually don't need to have a contract to have been concluded. What you need is an obligation which has been freely assumed to exist. So I would say that the summary of this um, case of the court already said uh, at, the, at the beginning of the existence of the Brussels Convention is that matters relating to a contract does not mean that a contract is needed, but there is a need of an obligation which has been freely assumed by one party towards another. A tort for the purposes of the regulation means something which is not a contract, so the categories are mutually exclusive. You are either under a contract or you are either in tort. And um, the court also said a claim for damages for the purposes of the regulation is almost always either a contract or a tort. Now, was this enough for the national courts to find their way? Well, no, because otherwise we wouldn't be here. So national courts kept on sending questions to the Court of Justice. And I looked back at the last five years to find uh, which questions were addressed and how the Court of Justice answered, because the Court of Justice can answer with a judgment, so it really goes to the merits of the, of the question because it identifies something new which has to be addressed, or it can simply um, answer by an order. An order means, okay, this question is exactly the same as before, so we simply repeat the, the, the solution that has, been, that has been already given in a previous case and there is no need to go into the merits. But the fact is that new questions are addressed to the court and the court answers with proper judgments. And the court answers as well asking the, the advocate generals to help the court with conclusions because the court could also adjudicate or solve the, the preliminary references without conclusions. But still, the questions that you refer to the Court of Justice seem to be important enough to, for the Court of Justice to answer with judgments and having conclusions in many uh, situations. So why do national courts ask the Court of Justice? In my humble understanding is first, looking back, as, as I said, only to the five last years, first because you have to understand the Brussels system, so for our purposes, Article 7.1 and 7.2, you have to understand it in the broader picture. And the case which would um, um, be an example of this would be uh, the Schmidt case. In the sense that, uh, well, first, you have to understand that there is not only Article 7.1 and 7.2, but there are all more provisions within the regulation, and sometimes the interpretation is about 7.1 in relation to Article 24, for instance. Or the Brussels regulation does not exist in a vacuum. There are also some other international conventions, and you have to interpret Article 7.2 in relation to the carriage of passengers by air, the convention, the Montreal Convention. Okay. So national courts are not clear as to how to understand this interaction between the Brussels system and this, or within the Brussels systems, or the Brussels system in the broader picture, and questions are addressed to the Court of Justice. Then sometimes what happens is that the solution which has been given uh, in previous cases has an unclear scope or needs to be tested against new questions. In this regard, I would say that sometimes the national courts lack a little bit of imagination and I guess they could have solved questions simply, new, apparently new questions simply by looking a little bit more thoroughly to the case law of the court, but nevertheless. You can see that there are quite a lot of questions which address seemingly new cases which where the solution does not, the previous solution does not really fit or 
Now, an interesting uh, situation is when the national court is simply unhappy with the solution that the court has given. So it gives it another try. So let's ask again the court of justice and see whether it changes a little bit or whether it confirms. And when it confirms, it's also important because it means that the national solution cannot prevail. You have to follow what the court has said. And um, this is also uh, what may also happen is that the solution that the court has given is not fit even within the system. So the court has uh, could could give a more satisfactory solution for the application, not not to insert the solution into the national system, but for the application of the proper of the of the uh, regulation itself. So. Now, I wanted to address uh, this case law, but maybe in order not to take much time, I will simply um, well, address some of the case law I have mentioned in the previous slide. You will have the slides, so later you can, you can have a look at them. So, uh, for instance, a situation of the second kind where the scope of the, 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 this idea that a contract is um, or a matter relating to a contract uh, requires that there is an obligation freely assumed by one party towards another. This was uh, put into question in the Grana, Grana Rolo case in 2015, where there was no formal contract but just a de facto relationship between two parties. One of them was uh, giving merchandise to the other and the other one was paying back. So. Of course, there were documents, there were invoices, but there was no formal contract. And the court, well, very easily, the court said, okay, look, there is a de facto uh, contract. There is a tacit uh, contractual relationship. So the fact that there is nothing in written uh, form does not entail that we are outside the scope of Article 7, number one. Then in um, a second case, the issue was, well, what if, we're, what if we are asking, so the claimant is asking for the declaration of nullity of a contract, are we still within the realm of contracts, or because the declaration is for nullity, are we outside and we are rather in torts? And the court said, no, no, we are uh, within Article 7.1, the existence of a legally uh, valid and binding contractual relationship, so the discussion on the existence of this relationship falls under the scope of Article 7. The next case might be a little bit more tricky. The case is about a loan. A couple uh, borrowed some money from a bank to pay for a house that they had bought in common. And then later they split it up. Uh, the wife or the female partner went to uh, another country and the, uh, the other partner had to pay all the mortgage. So at a certain point he said, okay, that's, it's time to try to get reimbursement of what I have paid. And the question was, okay, in the relation to the bank, there was a contract between the two co-debtors and the, and, the, and the bank. But what about in the mutual relationship? And the court said, okay, yes, this, there is a contract uh, here as well. So the claimant, the one of the debtors, can use Article 7, number 1 against the other debtor. So let's say that here what you can see is something which is also very typical of the court when interpreting Article 7, number 1, which is to try to, to interpret it in an elastic way so as to have more um, claims falling under the scope of Article 7, 1, although sometimes I'm not so sure that this is uh, true in practice. It was true in the following case, flight right. In flight right, it was a case, typical case, which has happened to you many times, I guess. You, catch a, you, you take a flight from one place to a final destination with a stopover somewhere. And what happens is that the first leg of the trip is um, there is a carrier. For instance, in this case, it was Air Nostrum, and your trip was from Ibiza to uh, Palma de Mallorca with the idea of continuing to the final destination in Dusseldorf. And the, the ticket had been bought by the passengers only to the one company, not to the two companies, but they had bought the, the ticket to, to one company. And then, uh, the, as I said, the first flight was uh, made by a different company. Because the, flight, the first flight was delayed, uh, they missed the connection, and instead of getting to Dusseldorf in the time foreseen, they get there the next day. And they uh, wanted to sue the company which had made the trip from Ibiza to Palma. So not the, the company with, uh, which had sold the, the ticket, but actually the one who had actually uh, made them miss the connection. And the question was, okay, do we have a contract here? And if you think about the previous case law of the court about change of contracts, where you need an obligation which is freely assumed between claimant and defendant, you would say, no, look, 
there is no contract here between the passengers and this company, which was just uh, yeah, acting on behalf of the actual seller of the ticket. The court here used a little bit of a complicated um, reasoning because it looked uh, not only to the facts but also to uh, the regulation, um, a, a European regulation which has to do with the rights of passengers. And it is said there that these uh, companies, the, the company which performed the first uh, leg of the trip, actually is taking up the position of the other one. So finally the court said, okay, there was a contract between the passengers and, uh, and the, the, the company for the purposes of the regulation. And, uh, well, I'm going to skip uh, the other cases. Uh, and, well, no, I cannot skip Broxita because Broxita is again a case uh, where you have this elastic uh, idea of a contract and which apparently did not fit well with uh, German national law. So again, you, you find one situation where Germany was not uh, happy and actually Germany has uh, referred another question to the Court of Justice, probably trying, as I said before, trying to get a different answer or trying to confirm that one. And in this case, the idea was that a specific uh, conduct could be, uh, it was a conduct that could be um, characterized either as a contract or it could be uh, considered as a question of anti-competitive conduct. So it was someone who had uh, someone who was uh, selling luxury watch, wristwatch, and it has asked uh, with a contract uh, somebody else to produce the machinery of the watch to, to simplify it. But there was an exclusive an exclusivity clause in the sense that this person who was fabricating the machinery could not sell could not make it for other for other contractors. And he did. So when Broxeter, when, when the, 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 the person, the, the seller of the, of the watch, Broxeter, wanted to sue uh, this uh, manufacturer, the question was whether he was, could sue in contract or in tort. According to German law, it could uh, use both because there is no principle of non cumul so he could use both. But for the purposes of the regulation, the court said, no, look, this is rather a contract because it is true that there is an anti-competitive conduct somewhere there, but in order to assess it, you have to interpret the contract. So therefore, there is this vis attractiva we said does not exist, actually, to some extent exists, and uh, the situation is to be addressed under Article 7, Number 1, and not under Article 7, Number 2. So as I said, uh, there are pending questions uh, before the court, which to my mind, m many of them could be uh, answered in the light of previous case law of the court. But uh, well, I'm not. Uh, I'm not so sure. One of the uh, one of the funniest exercises I like to I used to like to do with my with my students was to give them case law of the court and then to give them a pending question and see whether they reach the the correct outcome. Um, well, I'm not going to tell you about the what what happened next. So this was the first part of the presentation on the notion of contract and tort, and uh, you can see that the notion of contract is quite wide. The notion of tort is, because of this mutual exclusivity of the categories, the notion of, of tort well, should be, theoretically at least, less, uh, less extensive. Now the next steps, what I want to address here is um, what happens once that uh, something has been characterized as a contract or as a tort. And, uh, well, I would say that as a national court, uh, probably when something is a matter relating to a contract, the situation is not extremely difficult for several reasons, uh, in the sense that, well, of course you have to assess which is the obligation in question, so it's not only because something is a contract that immediately you are going to be to have jurisdiction, you have to, to take the obligation which is uh, underlying the claim, and you have to find out which is the place of performance of this obligation. And uh, the background is, well, early case law of the court, where the court said, okay, imagine the most simple contractual structure, one obligation, fine, no problem, you go to the place of performance of this obligation. Then what happens if uh, the structure of the contract is synalagmatic, there are two obligations, one on the side of the claimant, or the, or the buyer, for instance, one of the side, the side of the seller, and both of them are suing each other in front of the same court, well, then the problem is that you have two obligations, therefore two different jurisdictions, because the place of performance may be very easily in different uh, jurisdictions. And, uh, well, 
what happens if you have a structure which is, which is even more complicated? It's not only one obligation on one side, one obligation on the other side, but many obligations on one side and many on the other. So the court had to, was asked the very early about this. It got to some not very satisfactory solutions, and that's why there was a legislative amend amendment, which has already been uh, addressed here by Alec, in the sense that, well, let's make it easy. Let's take the most uh, current contracts, which are those for the sale of goods and those for the provision of services. The rest, well, there are still some contracts which would not fit under these categories. But for these categories, we are going to um, say that whatever you want to discuss, what is going to be relevant for the purposes of establishing jurisdiction is the place of performance of just one obligation, which is going to be in the case of the sale of goods, um, the place where the goods have to be uh, delivered or the place where the service has to be performed. Okay, so more or less easy. Now, not so easy. If it was so easy, again, we wouldn't be uh, with having recent case law. And the recent case law may address uh, maybe questions uh, referred to the court on different questions. So, for instance, in this uh, Careda case, which, remember, is the one about the loan, the couple who borrowed a loan, the question is, okay, fine, we are under Article 7, number 1, this is a contract, but what is the obligation which will finally, uh, which the place of performance of which will finally uh, give jurisdiction to one, uh, to one court? And the, the, the court said, okay, let's go to the uh, origins of the obligation, let's go to the loan contract, and therefore, in, uh, as between the two co-debtors, the place of performance will be the place of the institution, the bank, because the contract actually was the loan contract. So the, the co-debtors probably may not have thought about this, but in terms of proximity, it makes sense, because uh, finally the problem was the loan, which had not been paid uh, partially by one of the parties. And also, in terms of legal certainty, well, you have borrowed some money from a bank. Even if you later go to another country and change your domicile, you cannot pretend that it was absolutely a surprise that you are sued by the co-debtor where the bank is located. In the flight right case, so the case about uh, the, the ticket uh, and the passenger and the, and the, and the company who, who performed the service for the first flight, flight, the question was whether this company, who actually thought that uh, could be sued, maybe in Ibiza or in Palma, whether it could be sued in Dusseldorf, and the Court of Justice said yes, and again, because of the same idea that, uh, well, uh, the, the, the carrier, the actual carrier, is acting on behalf of the one who is in the ticket, let's say. Of course, in terms of proximity, again, well, you may say, of course, the Air Nostrum, which was the, the, the first um, air company, cannot, uh, cannot um, be a, a contest in terms of proximity that Dusseldorf is the place where you can see whether the, the flight arrived late. Uh, in terms of uh, legal certainty, I don't, I'm not sure whether Air Nostrum had in mind that it could be sued in Dusseldorf. You have to, uh, well, or I should say as well, that it is for the claimant in cases like this to decide whether to sue at the place of final destination or at the place uh, where the, flow, the, the flight uh, started. So, well, it can choose and maybe finally the company could also be sued in, in, in Spain. And then you, you have a case, a Portuguese case, uh, where the court, the Portuguese court addressed no less than 12 questions to the Court of Justice because it was a commercial concession. And here you have the typical case, which is very much complicated. And uh, well, which is the obligation? Is this a supply of, of goods? Is this a sale of goods? And where to, how to apply Article 7.1 to this case was not, um, was not extremely simple. So what the Court of Justice said, in this case, it went, it tried to apply a principle which I have not mentioned yet, but which makes sense and which goes against fragmentation. Uh, it said, okay, of course there are many obligations, obligations on one side and obligations on the other, so let's try to identify the characteristic obligation of the contract, so just one. So if the contract uh, is, um, and the court got to the conclusion that well, it was a contract uh, for the supply of services, looking at the characteristic obligation. Then it had to uh, identify the place of performance, and it said, okay, uh, a service implies, the notion of service implies that the party who provides the service carries out a particular activity in return for remuneration. 
an activity means a positive act and not a mere omission. If there are several places of performance of this activity, then uh, one has to identify the place of the main activity, which will be normally the place of the main provision of uh, services, or finally, if it's not easy to be identified, yeah, it ends up in the place of the uh, agent. So I will skip the pending questions. One of the pending questions we have was already addressed by Alex uh, is the la suite, uh, la, la suite of the Pula parking case about uh, whether parking on the street and paying uh, the ticket uh, in the machine is actually a contract or whether it is a tort. And I have to add, according to the National Court, could it be a tenancy agreement under the, the scope of Article 24 of the regulation? So neither 7.1, neither 7.2, but actually uh, Article 24. Okay, let's see what the Court of Justice says to this. So now, now let's move to tort, and in the case of tort, uh, the next steps, okay, we know that we are in the, a tort situation under Article 7.2. Now, how, how do we apply Article 7 to? And here, the situation is not as easy, at least uh, as easy as in under Article 7.1, because of course you have to think that there are many different kinds of torts, and that, for instance, a car, an, an accident uh, with a car has very little to do with prospectus liability. The rights uh, that can be affected, harmed by a tort, can be very much, very much different in nature. So, personality rights have uh, very little to do with, uh, I don't know, with. Uh, trademarks, for instance, and uh, also the damages you can be claiming uh, may also be very different. Different. So one thing is a material damage and another thing is a, a pecuniary loss. So when the, the national court has to have all these different variables into, in, in mind when trying to apply Article 7 too. But not only this, it also has to have in mind that the situations can be really plural. So again, there is a background in the sense that they, we, we had Article 7.1 or that uh, 7.2 at the time, Article 5.2. And very early, the Court of Justice was asked about specific situations as, for instance, what happens if we have a harmful event which happens in one member state, but we have the consequences of this harmful event, so the damage, it's located in another member state. So this was a very a situation which was very easy, easy to imagine because we are talking about cross-border situations. So what the court said was, okay, let's interpret the place of the harmful event as being both, both the place of the harmful event and the place of the damage, and the claimant, the victim, can choose to sue the defendant in one place or the other, because from the point of view of proximity, it makes sense. At the place of the harm, you can find the evidence regarding the conduct. At the place of the damage, you can find the evidence regarding how much it is, let's say. And from the point of view of the, of the legal certainty, from the point of view of the defendant, okay, if he's throwing something uh, which is um, contaminating, polluting into a river which flows from France to Germany, or the other way around, um, probably he should know that, um, that the pollution is going to reach, uh, to go away from the regional country and reach the, the second one. So let's say that it was more or less uh, correct. Then the court had to solve some questions which had to do with damage, such as, well, what happens if there is one event, no problem, conceptually one damage, for instance, against personality rights caused by libel, but it happens that this damage is experienced in different member states because it was caused by a publication which was edited in the UK, but it happened to be uh, distributed in several member states, so the damage against the privacy uh, is felt in several member states. And the court said, okay, from the point of view of proximity, we could go to the place of the damages, of the different damages. From the point of view of legal certainty, what the court this, did, and this here you can see that the court is creating, the court said, okay, you can go to every single, uh, the claimant can sue in every single place where the damage has been caused, but only jurisdiction will be limited to this damage. So either you sue for the whole damage in the place of the event, or you can sue in different places if you want. You can fragment the claim, but in every single place you can only sue for this specific uh, part of the damage. Then there were uh, some other cases where, uh, well, these were the three main cases, where the question was not, was again the fragmentation of the damage, but not in relation to different places, but in relation to different persons. So I suffer, a, I'm the victim of something, a car accident. 
and uh, well, my partner also um, suffers because I'm suffering, let's say. So is he entitled to use Article uh, 7.2 at the place where he feels the damage or has, can he sue or should he sue in the place where I, which I am the initial victim, suffered the damage? And the court said, okay, for, in terms of proximity and legal certainty, there's no problem in that the partner sues the, the, the perpetrator, but it has to be at the place where the damage has been suffered by the principal victim. And in case one person suffers an initial damage and subsequent damages, uh, the only damage which is important for the purposes of Article 7.2 is the initial damage. So if, for instance, um, because of uh, sickness uh, caused by a traffic accident, I cannot work, the initial damage is the one which is caused by the car accident, and the other one is subsequent, subsequent damage, of course, I can sue for it, but only in the place of the initial damage. So all this was said by the court relatively early, but again, it was not sufficient. So what we have is recent case law of the Court of Justice, mainly in what, how to locate the locus damni or the locus delicti commissi. Here I went back 10 years ago, because what you can see is that the court has been facing waves of cases. So we can... Um, group the case law uh, in cases which had to do with the internet, internet environment and different kinds of uh, rights. So, of course, the lawmaker of the Brussels Convention could not think that besides the real world there, is a, there will be a virt virtual world at some point and that many contracts but also many torts happen in the virtual world. So, uh, first the court was asked, well, personality rights, what happens if an information, which is actually defamatory, is uploaded on the net and it spreads around everywhere because the web is accessible everywhere. So the court was asked, um, the victim, can the victim sue uh, at the place where the event happened? Of course it can. Can it sue at the different places where the damage has been caused? So all the places where the web is accessible, all, all the member states where the website is accessible. And the court said yes, but only for the limited damage that has been, that has, uh, been identified in this particular member state. And the court said something else. It said, and this was creation, so activism, I would say, it said, and the victim can also sue at the center of, at his center of principal interest for the whole thing. So this would mean that there is the place of the event, which is normally the place where the perpetrator has his establishment or his residence. There will be places of damages, and there will be, a, at the place of the event, the claim can be for all the damage and at the place of the damages for the different separate damages, and there will be a third place, which is the center of principal interest of the victims, normally his domicile, where he can sue for the whole damage. But, funny thing, it only works in the internet with personality rights. When you have copyrights, or when you have trademarks, then the court has said, okay, we keep the accessibility criterion. So, for instance, in the case of copyrights, if the damage uh, because of the, of the reproduction of uh, pictures, for instance, without respecting the copyright. There is a damage in different member states. Okay, we keep the accessibility criterion, so the author, the owner of the picture can sue for the different damages in different member states, but there is no center of principal interest of the victim. If he wants or she wants to sue for the whole damage, there is only the place of the event, which is, to be, uh, is going to be the establishment of the person uploading the picture uh, without authorization. And in the case of the trademarks, what you have to have in mind, and the court also had it in mind, is that even if the environment is the internet, trademarks, the same as patents, are only protected in a territory, the, the territory where they are registered. So this uh, makes it much easier to, to make, to restrain the scope of Article 7, number 2, in terms of uh, damages. The second wave of cases uh, have to do with cartel and anti-competitive uh, conduct. These are very complicated cases. These are factually very complicated cases because normally you will have a cartel with several, um, several um, participants extending in time, uh, having effects in many, in many countries. So, uh, and it gets even more complicated when it's not only about a cartel but it is also about anti-competitive anti conduct. So, yeah, because it's a mix of, of uh, of uh, cartel, anti-competitive conduct, and the court had to try to identify uh, which was the place of the event and, uh, well, and the place of the different damages. And there's a whole construction where I would say, again, the court was very creative. 
And finally, the last uh, wave of cases the court is dealing with in the last, in the last uh, 10 years have to do with pecuniary laws. Already the cases regarding cartel and anti-competitive conduct, of course, have to do with losses which are pecuniary. This, there is not necessarily a material damage. And here you have a precedent in the Kronhofer case and three recent cases which are, uh, again, the question is, where do you locate, where do you locate, where does the court locate a uh, damage which consists only in the loss of, of money? And uh, the court is very reluctant, this has always been the case, to say, okay, the domicile of the victim, of course, if I pay something from my domicile, uh, I make an investment and, well, the investment finally uh, ends up in losses and I claim that it is because I was not properly informed that I made this investment, so I can sue in terms of prospectus, li pro prospectus liability. The place of the damage I could perfectly claim is my domicile because I have my assets in my domicile, so this is, it is here that I am losing, that I am, that I am the victim of the that I am experiencing the damage. But the court is, as I said, very reluctant to go to the domicile of the victim because you have to remember the origins of the, 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 the structure of the system is lets you first in the domicile of the defendant, so coming to the domicile of the, of the claimant would be a complete uh, change of the whole uh, environment. But it still, it has said, and it is still constructing this, it has said, okay, the domicile of the defendant could be used if there is something else in addition that uh, creates a link with the case. So, for instance, if the bank account is in the domicile, the bank account from which the payment or the investment was made is in the domicile of the defendant, then the victim can sue in his domicile. Or, progressively, the court has been adding new conclusions, new um, connecting factors, and that's why I am saying that maybe the court is not in, only using proximity for interpreting, but actually for correcting. Okay, uh, with this, I, as I could not address, well, pending question is a very important question, at least in political terms, because it's actually a case in relation to cars where a device was put which made the cars seem to be less, that they polluted less when they had to pass a test in order to be sold, but then afterwards the device did not work any longer and the cars are really polluting. So the buyers of the cars, which could actually be considered as consumers, are suing in order to get back the money that they have paid, that they think they shouldn't have paid if they had known that the car was not properly built, let's say, but I don't know how the court will solve this. Now, consequences, and with this I end up, I didn't know what to address as consequences, so I tried to say, okay, I'm a judge. What would I do if I was looking at this case law of the Court of Justice? Well, I would get crazy, probably. So the first thing would be, as I told you at the very beginning, in order to solve a case which, where you have to apply the Brussels One regulation or whatever regulation in European procedural law, try to think like the Court of Justice. Mm -hmm. And this means one thing you cannot do is to try to um, think in terms of your national law. Remember, autonomous interpretation. Autonomous interpretation is you have to uh, interpret thinking, not, well, or at least not thinking about national law. Autonomous interpretation uh, means uh, taking into account very seriously proximity between the court and the facts, but also legal certainty. So you have to try not to surprise the defendant. And most of the times, at least in contracts and in torts, the defendant has done something. I mean, the defendant uh, know, knew that, if, for instance, in the case of a prospectus liability, if the prospectus was uh, notified in another country, it knows that it's quite probable that, that people will uh, trust this prospectus. So finally, it's his own act which leads uh, to a claim in this country and he cannot say, well, this is a surprise for me. Uh, you can also think that the court does not like fragmentation. So if you can't make a, a notion elastic so as to uh, have only one court um, deciding on a complex case, this is better than having fragmented solutions. But sometimes it doesn't, does not work. Uh, but nevertheless, and uh, you have to try to keep consistency with uh, former cases, so I would advise you to read the case law of the court when you have a, a, new, a new situation, try to find the solution in the, in the previous case law of the court. Then you can ask yourself other questions like, well, why do I what do I have to check in order to apply the Brussels 1 regulation or these particular provisions? Uh, 
because sometimes what I am, what I was telling you may seem very difficult to apply at the stage or to check at the stage when you are only checking your jurisdiction. So it seems rather as you are going to the substance of the claim. And of course, at the first stage of the, of the claim, you don't have this information. So what the Court of Justice says is, don't worry, don't go to the substance, just work with the materials which your uh, Procedural law allows the claimant to give you at that time or the defendant to, to give you at that time. So you can have in mind both what the claimant and the defendant provides to you, but just make a prima facie assessment of this because otherwise you will never go farther from the stage of assessing jurisdiction. And uh, another question you may ask yourself is, okay, I have decided on jurisdiction thinking that this is a contract. Am I bound to solve the substance, the substance of the case in contractual terms, or can I change and say, for the purposes of the applicable law, this is taught? You can make that. So whatever you have said at the jurisdictional level, uh, when you assess your, your jurisdiction, is not binding in the next steps. It might sound weird, but uh, it works like this. Okay, and I leave the, the Lega Ferenda because it's the Lega Ferenda. Thank you.